This is a great turnout. So nice to see you all. Uh, welcome to our annual Sherman Lecture um, in Gender and Sexuality Studies. This annual lecture was named for Elizabeth Munvis Sherman, a class of 77 and Brown Parent for her extraordinary leadership in raising funds to endow the Pembroke Center's seed grant program. So we thank her, uh, Elizabeth Sherman. And this year we are very excited to welcome Trisha Rose, Professor of Africana Studies and Director of the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America at Brown University to deliver the lecture. Rose was born and raised in Harlem in the Bronx in New York City and graduated from Yale University where she received a BA in sociology and then received her PhD from Brown University in American Studies. She has taught at NYU, UC Santa Cruz, and has since 2006 been a professor of Africana Studies at Brown. Rose is an internationally respected scholar of post-civil rights era black US culture, popular music, social issues, gender, and sexuality. She has been awarded for her teaching and has received several scholarly fellowships, including ones from the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the American Association of University Women. She is well known for her groundbreaking book on the emergence of hip-hop culture, Black Noise, Rap Music, and Black Culture in Contemporary America is considered a foundational text for the study of hip hop, one that has defined what is now an entire field of study. Black Noise won an American Book Award from the Before Columbus Foundation in 1995, was voted among the top 25 books of 1995 by The Village Voice, and in 1999 was listed by Black Issues in Higher Education as one of its top books of the 20th century. Quite an honor. Um, in 2003, Rose published a rare oral narrative, History of Black Women's Sexual, li sexual Life Stories, called Longing to Tell, Black Women Talk About Sexuality and Intimacy. In 2008, Professor Rose returned to hip hop to challenge the field that she helped found with the book, The Hip Hop Wars, What We Talk About When We Talk About Hip Hop and Why It Matters. She is currently working on a public narrative project and the workings of structural racism. In addition to her teaching and scholarship and her directorship of, at CSREA, Rose speaks to a broad public audience on issues related to African-American culture, US social issues, gender, and sexuality. And with that, I am very happy to introduce her and turn the floor over to her for her lecture, Black Feminism, Popular Culture, and Respectability Politics. Thank you. Super, thank you so much. Wow, this is a big crowd. Thank you guys for coming out. This is great. Old friends and new family. I see Anne Ducille and Lynn. We were all buddies here back in the old days of American studies. That is what we should call it, it's the old days. Um, anyway, I'm really excited to be here. You are all very wide, so I'm gonna have to go like this a lot. And I don't know, I might forget. So wave to me from back there, okay? Help me, thank you, Lynn. <laughs> oh, excellent. And someone I don't know, but thank you too. <laughs> um, I'm really happy to be here. This is a great honor. I appreciate you all coming and for to be given the honor to, to give the Sherman Lecture. Um, it's a, a very distinguished part of Pembroke's uh, programming. And I wanna thank Suzanne Stewart Steinberg and Debbie Weinberg, wherever she is, I lost her, for thinking of me and for giving me this opportunity. I also wanna thank two students, one graduate student, one undergrad, for their help with research, which was really terrific. Mina um, Asayesh Brown and Amanda Boston. I, don't, I see Mina, but I don't know if Amanda's here, but I wanna thank you both for excellent research. I had like a fine 10,000 things that say blah, 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 and they came back pretty close. Like, all right, it wasn't 10,000, but you get my point. Um, so today is kind of a lecture, kind of thoughts in progress. I have more questions than answers um, to the issue that I wanna focus on. So I'm, I'm excited to talk with you, but I'm even more excited for the conversation because I'm, I really wanna hear what it both provokes and you know, how it fits in with what you're thinking and what, what kinds of sort of conversations we can have. But I will put my cards on the table. I'm known for this. I'm like, let's just cut right to like, you know, what we're really meaning from the beginning. I've always been quite frustrated by deep indirection. So I'll tell you what the question is that drives what is now then going to be a meandering project through town. 
The underlying question comes from a series of graduate seminars in black feminism that I've taught here in Brown uh, over the X number of years, 10 years that I've been here, um, and an increasing sort of realization that um, there was a growing generational divide among black feminists over, in, well, I mean, there's always been some sort of generational divide in every generation, but there was a particular one emerging around what constitutes sort of feminist resistance in the popular cultural arena for black feminists. Everything I say, put black in front of it. So if I leave it out, just add black. I know people usually do that and they mean white. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm doing the opposite today. So when you don't hear black, don't think white. Just go, oh, she meant black. She left it out. OK. Um, so, <laughs> um, so what accounts for the black feminist generational divide over what can be called black feminist popular performance and what we think can't be called black feminist popular performance or what we think fails to meet some sort of standard about what constitutes a, a feminist performance. And by feminist here, I mean to imply something that uses gender and sexuality and women's experiences of one way or another to challenge predominant hierarchies and ideologies around sex and gender and race, etc. You know, it doesn't just mean a sort of just pro-woman in the very broadest abstract sense. It's meant to be a political challenge. That, that's how I'm using it. And so I was really struck, uh, you know, um, over the past couple of few years that this debate that I saw bubbling up in my own classes um, started to take really significant hold in the public arena, uh, particularly around this thing called respectability politics. And so I was fascinated with what almost felt like a takeover of respectability politics. Like it went from being something someone occasionally said, or if someone happened to have read the book it came from, it might be quoted, to pretty much an answer to everything that looked or walked or talked like respectability politics. And it's just really been quite a, quite a significant um, term. But there have been sharp public debates uh, and disagreements over not only what constitutes respectability politics, but whether or not it's a slur or a, or a, or a source of praise. So it's going on everywhere. The Schomburg did a, you know, after again doing a lot of sort of, well, who's doing what? They did a debate on respectability politics. I thought that was inventive. I've not really known the Schomburg to do debates on gender issues per se, so I was pretty excited. I was like, hmm, you know, a, a respectability debate. There have been tons of scholarly and journalistic articles, op-ed pieces, and then lest we not mention black Twitter, which is a respectability politics ground zero. Just go ahead, put in the hashtag, and have a good week. <laughs> so this is an intense debate from of all sort of different kinds of engagement levels and groups. Um, overall, the advocates for respectability politics support the, the rules and strictures of traditional middle class decorum and propriety, and overall, the critics of respectability politics, they cry out for a challenge to it, which I'll lay out, but also a freedom of expression. So it's not that there is so much uh, an opposite to respectability politics per se, but it is in fact uh, is positioned in oppositional relationship to the notion of freedom of expression in some broad sense, whether it's political expression or sexual expression, et cetera. Um, so this uh, respectability politics has moved center stage among scholars uh, and journalists, especially vis-a-vis -vis the last several years of police cases that have been caught on camera of either physical assault or ac outright murder of African-American young people. And it became very charged in the context, say, of, in obviously of Trayvon Martin, you know, whether or not he looked like he was going to be a menace. Then it became up again with the Mike Brown case in Ferguson, in which there were many, many questions about whether or not him having potentially stolen some cigars, justifying what was then the encounter with Darren Wilson. Was he threatening? Was he behaving in a way that somehow motivated this? This is classic respectability politics from some points of view, and it was incredibly uh, uh, enraging to many. Um, there were lots of questions around it. Why couldn't the Ferguson protesters protest without looting, without setting fires? You know, this is, this is a more respectability political 
um, analysis. Um, then the fabulous hashtag, if they gunned me down, turned up, which was this terrific challenge to the implicit respectability politics and the manipulation of it for political purposes to say, what pictures will they show of me after they've gunned me down? And they'll sort of drag out me, you know, in some fake teeth with a 40 ounce, you know, with a fake plastic gun when there's 100 pictures of me graduating from high school and talking to my teachers and taking care of my nephew, et cetera, et cetera. So respectability politics took central stage. Um, but what's interesting is that Respectability politics, for the most part, comes out of a black feminist tradition. But most of its public analysis didn't really have a feminist framework, for the most part. It also has a, a cross-gendered historical analysis and framework. It's not limited to discussing the particular nature of respectability for women, but it comes out of a black feminist practice. And I'm going to come back to that, but, but it's important to, to make that correction. So today, I want to interrogate a few dimensions of this debate as it has shaped up during the Obama era and to focus on what this debate reveals and what it obscures. I'm especially interested in what kinds of questions and systemic dynamics drop out of the polarization between this middle class respectability politics on the one hand and this freedom of cultural sexual expression on the other. As in what kinds of questions and systemic dynamics drop out when we polarize the conversation this way. So some questions that interest me are one are, are all of the goals of, of a respectability politics, not the respectability politics, are all of the goals of a respectability politics to be condemned and defined as a middle class form of racial social control? Does the mere refusal of a respectability politics, that's to say people who challenge respectability politics, does a mere refusal actually enable radical progressive expression politically or sexually? In other words, does this mere challenge go far enough? Can we simply challenge progressive, I'm sorry, challenge respectability politics and in its place, therefore find a kind of progressive uh, alternative? Finally, are there progressive social and sexual standards beyond respectability politics terms that we might considering, uh, consider adopting in its place? Well, I'm not going to do number three. This is a whole other talk, but I just threw it out here in case it comes up later and you're excited about talking about it. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, and, and so before I get into this, because this is such, I mean, like I said, if you follow black Twitter, you'll know this is like ground zero. So let me just put some more cards on the table so we're not confused about my position in this debate. <laughs> I want you to spend the whole time going, where does she stand? Um, I can't listen, because I don't know where she stands. So I'm a long time intellectual defender of vernacular, black vernacular culture, and therefore often expressive culture that has vulgar components. Very few vernacular cultures around the world do not play fast and loose with the notion of what's acceptable and unacceptable. That's part of its entire formation. Um, I've always had time and place concerns, as in where, when, and what are the political consequences of certain vernacular expressions? What kind of publics are we constructing with it? It's not that I would stand against it. It's just been I've, those have been the places where I've had hesitations. I'm a complete advocate for greater sexual freedom within a sexual justice framework, more transparency, far less shaming, and I'm always for some, I've always been someone who's longed for an end to sexual double standards. I think I was kind of born with that annoyance. I don't, and I can't remember not being irritated by it. I'm also a strong believer in all my work argues for the radical potential of popular expressive culture to challenge a wide range of oppressive hegemonic norms. But this is not a given. I want to emphasize the word potential, because as someone who's written and, and taught and, and uh, read widely in this area for a long time, there's been quite a bit of slippage from popular culture as a place where this is a potential to an idea that it's in fact always going on, that the popular arena is a resistive space in and of itself. Um, and that would not be, that would have, if that were the case, you know, Stuart Hall would be wrong. And we all know Stuart Hall's not wrong. So, <laughs> so that should just take care of everything. But, but just joking. Um, but I do remain a student of Stuart Hall's and share the, the long ago and off sided notion, and cultural studies generally, that popular culture is not a genre nor a political position, but rather a terrain of struggle between resistance and incorporation of politically radical challenges to dominant repressive ideas. 
All of these investments are going to play a role in what I've been thinking about with this, uh, the black feminist potential in popular culture today and its relationship to respectability politics. So exactly what is respectability politics and where does it come from? It is a term coined by 19th century historian Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham. She used it in her very well regarded and terrific 1993 book called Righteous Discontent. The Women's Movement in the Black Baptist Church, 1880 to 1920. Respectability politics, as a term, was intended to describe morally focused work done by the Women's Convention of the National Baptist Convention, an organization of black Baptist church women that did important work at the turn of the 20th century, but framed a great deal of this work on defining and demanding respectable behavior as both a moral mandate and as a political strategy. Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham says the following. They, referring to the women of the Women's Convention, they felt certain that respectable quote unquote behavior in public would earn their people a measure of esteem from white America and hence they strove to win the black lower classes psychological allegiance to temperance, industriousness, thrift, refined manners and Victorian sexual morals. They revealed their conservatism, she continues, when they attributed institutional racism to the negative public behavior of their people as if rejection of gaudy colors in dress or snuff dipping, baseball games. Baseball games? <laughs> That's some strict stuff. On a Sunday, <laughs> and other forms of improper decorum could eradicate the pervasive racial barriers that surrounded black Americans. But she also notes that there was significant and often under-addressed positive and, and less uh, punitive components to the Women's Convention and their political work. She says, through the discourse of respectability, the Baptist women emphasized manners and morals while simultaneously asserting traditional forms of protest such as petitions, boycotts, and verbal appeals to justice. Ultimately, she concludes that the rhetoric of the Women's Convention combined both a conservative and a radical impulse. And then she talks about how to think about their conservative trajectory in ways that take seriously the, the context within which they were working. She obviously does a tremendous amount of contextualization vis-a-vis -vis the church and Christianity as a context. But she's also interested in thinking about the idea of, of a certain kind of black self-respect and dignity performance in public as a contested practice in the context of what the dominant ideologies were about black people of the time. So she wants to sort of say, look, it may look different now, but in 1890, it looked like so, that, that it, when quote unquote crude stereotypes of blacks permeated popular culture and when scientific racism in the work of social Darwinism prevailed among professional scholars, African Americans claims to respectability invariably held subversive implications. From the perspective of the Baptist women and others who espouse the importance of manners and morals, the concept of respectability signified self-esteem and racial pride and a search for common ground across various groups in America. But she also um, uh, talked about the interior dimension. And um, this, this interior dimension has been recently revisited by Randall Kennedy, who issued a kind of what he hopes is a progressive defense of respectability politics. I don't know if anyone's going for it, but it was a big, long cover story in The Atlantic. Um, but he uses a, a very useful phrase in which he, he revisits Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham and points to the interior dimension of the women's convention, saying that they were hoping to prevent the cage of segregation from imprisoning African Americans' inner lives. And a nanny Helene Burroughs, one of the women's convention's most influential leaders said, if in our homes there is implanted in the hearts of our children the thought that they are what they are, not by the environment, but of themselves, this effort by segregationists to teach a lesson of inferiority will be futile. Now today, the focus on white supremacy ideology to shape the inner psychological world of those it most vigorously oppresses to, in the words of Burroughs, to teach the lessons of inferiority is a highly under-examined component of respectability politics. It has fallen away from the public deployment of it and during, during this most recent renaissance. But it's also absent from the critics of respectability politics. That is to say, the question of the impact of either treatment, 
behavior, analysis, representation on the consciousness of a collective group of people who may find themselves in one or another form of vulnerable position is not actually on the table too much in this public debate on either side. Most proponents of respectability politics today can be called, uh, in a phrase I made up, sort of raw behavioralists. Um, they, they, those who espouse uh, respectability politics do not call generally for petitions and protests and racial challenges to racism, which were key hallmarks of the Women's Convention. Now we have a kind of brutal behavioralist rhetoric, unmoored from the concerns about any protest or about the debilitating impact of a constant narrative of deficiency and insult and how this might have an impact on self-worth or confidence or uh, of, of any group of people. Today's respectability politics lacks state demands and to ending racial discrimination uh, entirely. Instead, it, ex it, it relies almost exclusively on the idea that appropriate black behavior is the key to black success. Behavior is the main obstacle in this vision, and people who exhibit this bad behavior are their own worst enemy. So why has this new type of respectability politics become so prevalent. Why so much of this, why is so much of this visibly coming from black pundits and media figures and scholars who engage in the public? What's the drive for this very narrow and problematic, I would argue, conception, even, even more problematic than its origin, um, conception? So some have argued that today's respectability politics uh, especially arguments focused mainly on behavioralist rhetoric, was given more fuel by the broader racial language of the post-civil rights era and also the context of Barack Obama. The post-civil rights era uh, relies on an idea that all of, since all of the legal constraints related to racial uh, hierarchy have technically been removed, that it's all about behavior because all of the structures are no longer in play. Now, of course, people who study structural issues know that this isn't the case, but the narrative context is one that you can't point to Jim Crow as easily. You can't point to a public explicit narrative of white supremacy to develop a counter narrative. So some argue that this new context um, may have fueled this very behavioralist version. And the other being Obama's uh, being a president as the sign of complete success, but also his penchant for chiding black people. Um, whether you love or hate or like or don't have an opinion, it would, be, it would be hard pressed to make the case that if George W. Bush said any one of the things that Obama has said about black people to black people, he would have probably not made it out of whatever church he was in. <laughs> Pull up your pants, turn your baseball cap around, don't act like a thug, and these are his in particular. Be a good father, stop complaining about racism, turn off the TV and video games, read to your kids, don't feed them fried chicken for breakfast. Now, like I said, imagine W at the podium saying anything like that. We would have mayhem. For black women in particular, the bulk of these reprimands relate to sex, sexual behavior, and sexualized appearance. For the most part, it's an admonition to stop having babies, whether it's for the welfare or not for the welfare. Doesn't really matter. Stop having them. Have them all with the same people have them in a married context, or just stop having babies however else you're having them except this one way. Um, get married if you're not already and dress appropriately and that of course gets very complex but is always at the heart of the kind of respectability politics for, for black women. Um, Michael Dyson, who challenges and has written against respectability politics, says that it is based in the belief that good behavior and stern chiding will cure black ills and uplift black people and convince white people that we're human and worthy of respect. So I think this stern chiding is important because one has to be wrestled to the ground with their respectability politics. You can't just casually say, you know, why don't you maybe wear a slightly different dress? It's called change that outfit, stop having babies. You know, the whole thing has to be this very aggressive tenor. And I think that's an important subtext to, to, the, to the performance of it. Um, but political scientist Frederick Harris notes a distinction between older forms of respectability politics and what we see that today that I think is even more useful. He says, 
We started, or what started, as a philosophy promulgated by black elites to uplift the race by correcting the bad traits of the black poor has now evolved into one of the hallmarks of black politics in the age of Obama, a governing philosophy that centers on managing the behavior of black people left behind in a society touted as being full of opportunity. And he continues that, um, that, uh, that respectability politics has the effect of steering the unrespectables away from making demands on the state to intervene on their own behalf and towards self-correction and the false belief that the market economy alone will lift them out of their plight. In this sense, today's respectability politics is not adequately tethered to any critique of the state or neoliberal racial politics. But there's something else that's gone on that's going to play a role later on in the talk as well, and that has to do with visibility. The contemporary voices in support of respectability politics have grown more diverse and far more visible in mainstream society than, society than at any other point. Once mainly the purview of relatively non-mainstream, mostly black domains of religion and religious institutions, some political and local black social leaders, teachers, not me, but you know, successful business people. These, these were the places you would find you'd have to traffic in predominantly black spaces to hear this kind of narrative extensively. Now respectability politics far more visible, much more flashy and part of the black mainstream news and entertainment business. This relocation changes things. Highly visible crossover racial debate um, it includes and almost privileges those who support a respectability politics. So there's a public, you know, mainstream discursive chastising. So that's to say that even if the same argument might be made in, in two, it, the same argument might be made when it's made in two very different locations in a church basement among people who are, for whatever reason, trying to make this type of an argument versus on CNN, this is a wholly different kind of circulation and this is why context matters so much. So today we have a whole panoply of comedians and athletes and mass media journalists and celebrities like Chris Rock, Don Lemon, Charles Barkley, don't forget Barack Obama, he is the president, Raven Simone, don't ask me, Stacey Dash, <laughs> definitely don't ask me, and you know who, our beloved Bill Cosby said with quite dripping sarcasm, among others, have been part of the repositioning of what was a kind of homegrown and relatively invisible black conservatism into a mainstream white audience located vicious moral attack on the black poor absent any structural critique. Chris Rock's famous Bring the Pain comedy show in 1996, the one that uh, catapulted him into the comedy elite, featured a scathing and long set of jokes that served as the centerpiece of the show about the differences between black people, which are the good black people, and the others who he called a racial slur. I'll let you sort that out. This latter group of blacks, according to Rock, were, as Michael Denzel Smith summarizes, quote, gleefully uneducated, take pride in their criminal activities, and serve as the clumsy sidekick in, a, in black America's plan for liberation. This idea that a subset of ill-mannered black people hold all black people back is key to the logic of uh, respectability politics. I will say in Chris Rock's defense that he wrote a column a few years later talking about his regrets about that joke and how it was misunderstood, I don't know what that means, but, but also that it wasn't, he said, as well developed, that he wanted the idea, but the articulation basically moved the joke in a direction that he regretted. But I mean, that train left the station. By the time that got ridden, there was no getting on that train, bringing it back to Boston South Station. Um, <laughs> Raven Simone used her large daytime TV platform to announce that she wouldn't hire someone with a ghetto sounding name and any number of other things, which we'll, you know, I'll leave alone. There's lots of examples of this. Don Lemon has them every other day. Um, and he always seems confused by them. Like he says them and then he's confused. And like, well, I'm confused too. <laughs> Why don't you just get it straight before you call and start saying it, you know? I mean, at least be clear. I mean, Charles Barkley, you know, is just, and then there's a whole tirade by Bill Cosby. I didn't choose it because He's a complicated source right now, but there's a whole tirade about black women having so many babies by so many men that you would have to now have a DNA test to make sure you weren't involved with a relative, right? It was just like this, you know, I, ew, that's excellent. That's the deep analysis I was looking for. <laughs> it's like, ew, <laughs> that's exactly what I felt. 
Um, but, but again, this is, the idea that this has any traction, and it does, is, is, is very important. But I want to locate this not so much in just traditional sort of expressions of racism, but in the idea that black culture is itself pathological. Right, that this, this is based in, in a long-standing idea, not only of inferiority, but a pathological cultural black space that reproduces itself. I mean, this of course inures it, the, the critics of structural, I mean, the refusals to, those who refuse to acknowledge structural racism are protected by this argument because it says, look, it's gonna reproduce itself. We could throw money, we could have a war on poverty, we could stop mass incarceration. They'll, it's just gonna reproduce itself because the culture is itself dysfunctional and um, uh, problematic. The move from behavior as in how you get up and go to work and have breakfast and whether it's fried chicken or not or whatever it is you're eating is one thing, but it moves very quickly into expressive culture. So it becomes what's the, what are the creative articulations of black life that come immediately on the heels of this general, uh, this general challenge. So the vernacular culture is not a random target. Um, early on uh, during um, the women's convention, there was a lot of concern about the immorality of jazz. I mean a lot of concern. For those of you who don't study this, it's hard to believe, I'm sure, because it gets so much praise as pretty much an American elite art form in people's minds, but the vicious attacks on jazz and the blues, whatever young black people are listening to is in a world of trouble until they get old, and then it's okay. <laughs> so just keep that in mind, you hip hop fans. You are on your way, on your way. I'm already there myself, so I know you're coming. <laughs> it's just a matter of time. Um, so the movement from jazz to, you know, the style of hip hop, um, certain kinds of R&B, um, the idea here was that these all lack respectability as a whole, and therefore, um, more than culture generally, respectability politics focuses on vernacular style as a sign for broader deficiencies in everyday life, culture and clothing, style and music. So for black women, this question of cultural style, of course, it continues to be articulated in ways related to sexuality and desirability, but it, it, it gets attached to stylistic concerns, hairstyles, physical presentation, jewelry, and outfits, and of course, as I've said already, sexual, the presumption of sexual excess and out of place sexuality. Um, there's, and, Partly out of um, a relationship to the, the economic conditions that poor black communities face, but, but also related to mass media focus, there's a particular focus on prostitution and stripping as a twin act of sort of challenge to them as sex workers and as sex leisure. So it's whether it's sex work or sex leisure, there's, a, there's an equal level of both hyper association with black women, which you know, is not necessarily a bad thing to be associated with it, but I mean hyper association um, with it. And then this uh, effort to sort of to shame both practices. So someone like um, Amber Rose is an interesting example to me of someone who is playing this place very well, given the circumstances, to sort of force a different conversation about her choices and around what, what were modes of success as long as she was quiet, but as soon as she speaks, then somehow there's an effort to shame her. We can talk more about this in the Q&A. Um, but these um, sort of both sexual and beauty related uh, stereotype tropes have revised themselves. They're based on the old school models. No one really gets called a Jezebel or a Sapphire anymore, but you might be called Ratchet or a Diva or an evil black fill in the blank begins with a B, has itch in it. <laughs> um, and or the bitter black woman. So there's still the angry, you know, they would have been angry before, now it's bitter. Um, so these, these are revisions on these long-standing sort of sexualized and um, uh, regressive and, and angry uh, ideas. Um, and they are now playing out in the popular arena slash mass media arena very significantly. So for respectability politics, black cultural behavior is key to citizenship. This is a really interesting essay by Paisley Harris in which she talks about the way respectability politics links worthiness for respect to sexual propriety, behavioral decorum and neatness, uh, and says respectability served as a gatekeeping function, establishing a behavioral entrance fee. 
to the, uh, to the right to respect and full citizenship. And this feminist argument also parallels Fred Harris's uh, non-gendered, racialized argument about what the work respectability politics does when he argues the following, that in this era, marked by rising inequality and declining economic mobility for most Americans, but particularly for black Americans, the 21st century version of the politics of respectability works to accommodate neoliberalism. Um, the virtues of self-care and self-correction, he says, are framed as strategies to lift the black poor out of the conditions, out of their conditions by preparing them for the market economy. And I thought this was a very useful point, um, although there he's talking about the market economy. I mean, I'm sort of assuming because he didn't explain, but the market economy there as a worker, right, that you get prepared to participate perhaps just as a basic consumer and as a worker. So very useful. But what if we add another dimension to this argument and shift the gaze to women. What if we add the particular role of the culture industry as a part of the market economy and, and not understand the, the, the person, the unit as a worker so much as a, but as a consumer, um, what happens to that refocus? So if we say what if we say to him that this uh, that 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 this these strategies are um, preparing people for the cultural industry wing of the market economy, what would the content look like? Would it be respectability politics? Would respectability politics actually prepare people for the culture industry wing of the market economy? And I'd say no actually quite the opposite, that respectability politics has much less powerful place and that in the, mar in the culture industry, real black culture is mass, uh, the real black mass culture currency is not decorum and manners, the, the currency of respectability politics, but instead it's very opposite, the very behavioral tropes that respectability politics advocates are bemoaning. So in this context, the mass media culture industry wing of the market economy is fueled by the performances of the failures of black people and women in particular to meet the standards of respectability politics. This performance of criminality and sexual excess and more are the most popular and most profitable. Now some of this is a part of vernacular culture. Um, as I've said before, but the marketplace has played a significant role in constraining and redirecting black vernacular practice to the parodic mirror of key stereotypes of black excess and dysfunction. And this is really where the rubber meets the road and things get pretty, you know, complicated to sort out. I'm not suggesting I know the exact ratio here of right to wrong, but there's clearly the, the, the independent role of vernacular culture part playing a role, but at the same time, there's such dramatic consolidation of the representations of black people around the very stereotypes that have historically been understood by many, including, say, Patricia Hill Collins' narrative controlling images. Many, many sociologists and others have made this case that, that there's been a kind of collapse onto those tropes in the most visible and most profitable African-American uh, themed production, whether it's music or reality television. So how do we explain that? Can we just say this is vernacular culture, this is, you know, love and hip hop is what black women do when they're free on a Saturday? Is, I mean, I don't mean the watching, that may be true, but I mean the, the, the performances themselves, um, and you know, in my own, in the second book on hip hop, I spent quite a bit of time trying to explain why I felt that uh, what had happened with commercial hip hop was really problematic enough for us to have a hard, stern talk about it. And, and I think this is another one of those moments um, where um, we, we're, we're asked to consider the source of these representations as authentically black and any challenge to those representations as an importation of respectability politics. And what gets obscured is the manipulation that the market itself is doing to construct us as consumers of our own demise. And that is very hard to figure out because it's, there's so much going on in that moment. It's not that straightforward. It's not completely horrible. It's got these vernacular nuances and you know, uh, truthful representations of lived experience that it's very hard to really unplug. Um, so I'm gonna unpack this a little bit more, but just very quickly, 
Um, I happened to be at a conference where a black woman who works very high up in Nielsen was, was located, and I never get to talk to people who are high up in Nielsen, Nielsen being the organization that measures the consumption of all TV. <laughs> Just think about that. Okay, all TV. So if you, if you consent to getting one of those little boxes in your house, it'll, even if you land for one second on Fox News. <laughs> Just skip right over. Just don't even land. Anyway, I said, so what is the show black people are watching? I thought this couldn't be a better cab ride. Love and Hip Hop. That was the number one show and has been without challenge. The only body getting close is Empire. So just, you know, if you thought that respectability politics was driving the narrative that's going on in popular culture, think again. Not a whole lot of that going on on those shows. I'm not sure what show would be the counterpoint, but we can talk about that. Um, secondly, um, the particular way that um, co the, the collapse and the, the market's control of black vernacular practices and the way in which it works to also to accommodate neoliberalism is the ways in which uh, it, it has rendered black women in hip hop completely marginal. Now, there's always been sexism in hip hop, blah, blah, blah. We could have that argument or discussion. It's not really an argument. I don't know how any, I mean, I guess you could argue against it, but that would be creative. I'd give you an A for creativity, for sure. Um, but if you think about the high point of, of, of hip hop commercially, it is also the low point of women's formal participation. So if you wind back to say the early 1990s, before hip hop was the huge juggernaut it became in the late 1990s, early aughts, there were 40 black female MCs signed to major record labels. Guess how many there were in 2010? All right, say, if I, so there were started 40, okay, 30. Raise your hand if you think 30. That's a possibility. 20? 20. 10? 10. Come on, someone's got to raise their hand for 10. Okay, keep going, 10. All right, 10's good. Five? All right, excellent. Zero? You're all that bad? No, three. There were three. You were going to say three? I didn't want to go down one at a time. I was just trying to keep it moving, but you win. You got it. Three. So 40 signed female MCs to three. The number was so dramatic that the female, the best female MC category, which is some nonsense from the Grammy, so I'm not touting this, but it's a category that relates to the question of the landscape of the, they cut it just doesn't even exist. You can't even win it, <laughs> you know? They must give you some other special prize, like just for a sister who survived hip hop, <laughs> you get an award. <laughs> Commercial hip hop, you gotta put that in front of it. It's, it's a very big difference. Um, so part of what what's began to be of interest to me is the, is the, um, the concern which I've tried to express here in a long-winded way, is that by focusing on the rejection of, prud of the many prudish and self-destructive evils of respectability politics, we defend the performances of either artists or genres or TV shows who traffic in controlling images. And in this context, such artists appear resistant figures. Right, and that's the move that I'm really interested in. So it looks like they're resistant because they're, re they're rejecting the constrictors of respectability politics. So if you, in this context, um, it makes much more sense to me that this generational divide among black feminists is going on because with respectability politics as the primary framework, it's much easier to read younger uh, black uh, artists like Nicki Minaj, Beyonce, and Amber Rose as feminist Figures. Now, I'm not saying they don't have feminist dimensions or sometimes a phrase here or there, but to call them outright feminists would have to be argued a little more intensely than I normally read. I hear people say it a lot, and I hear people say, I oh, don't get why. I haven't yet read what I'd call a super convincing argument for why it is, except if it comes through respectability politics. In that context, it makes perfect sense because it's basically saying that the effort to control and constrain black women's sexuality and bodies is where oppression comes from. Therefore, acts of self-expression that feel freeing and opening and expanding, whatever they may be, are by themselves resistive because they're resisting respectability politics. But it's my argument that in mass media, there is no respectability politics governing what happens to for black women's performance or the expectations of what black women's bodies are supposed to do in other people's videos. 
right? So, so we're sort of fighting respectability politics over here when really it's over there, right? And, and by doing it over here, it renders us much less able to make a mass media neoliberal culture industry critique. So my question is, does fighting this war against respectability politics get you free? And does it equal the kind of sexual physical freedom that many people claim? Certainly many of the highest, and it's important that we're talking the very highest level of black female pop stars performances reject respectability politics behavioral entrance fee. And, and they can claim success and seem to be fully embraced by society fame uh, and adoration in doing so. So there is, a, a, it is a tremendous, uh, uh, it's an exhilarating idea in many ways. Um, and there's definitely, uh, given the options, controlling one's own expectations to hypersexuality is a political challenge to the system without a shadow of a doubt. And I would also offer a critique to this framework that others would, I think, uh, probably agree with, that there is no full binary opposition between respectability politics and personal sexual freedom, and maybe these extremes uh, are, don't fully explain the range of expression. And um, I've, I think here, too, of particular Beyonce and Nicki Minaj's use of alter egos. Nicki Minaj has gone over would kill. This must be 20 of them or something. Some are, you know, defunct, and then they come back. But it's the idea, right, that to, not to get trapped in one performance across this binary, you have a set of, I, of, of people, of characters, right? So with Beyonce, you have Sasha Fierce, and then you have the very prim Beyonce, <laughs> whenever you ask her anything. But not Sasha, she's a whole other, you know, story. So this, this helps, you know, attempts to free women from the binaries, but it also enables them to benefit from the divide. It doesn't become a critique of either side, it allows them to manage and negotiate it. So one of the final sets of questions I'm interested in and thinking about is, you know, is, is it a prerequisite? Is major mainstream success for black female, I, you know, super youthful pop stars, do, do you have to understand yourself as being capable of performing in some toil in some sphere of hypersexuality to be successful. This matters to me because if it's, if it's a prerequisite, then it makes it harder for me to see your options challenging it. If it's chosen because it's more profitable, that's another thing. But if it's pretty much a prerequisite, that is to say if Janelle Monet changed her physical style and went that route, would she be able to catapult herself into the stratosphere? Would she end up with the, in the, with the Rihannas and Beyonce's and Nicki Minaj's of the world? Would she, I'm not criticizing them, I actually like them all. I'm not as big a Nicki fan as I am. I like Beyonce, I like Rihanna a lot. No, no, no beef, don't, don't worry. Um, <laughs> I'm not part of the Bay Hive, though. Just get that clear. I don't. I don't. I don't belong to any hives. But um, <laughs> try to keep it independent. But um, but I do. I do like the work. But my question is: Is that really when and how women get catapulted? Now, I've not done any recent interviewing, but when I did ethnographic work in Black popular culture, I can tell you that there was tremendous pressure on women artists to wear as little as possible as the single most important way to garner visibility and success. Singing meant very little. I mean, in fact, nothing that you would think means something meant anything. Now, it might be different now. Things change, the market, you know, I'm not, but it definitely was the case. And there was lots and lots of both pressure and frustration among lots of artists who would speak privately off the record, but obviously cannot say anything in public. And this also speaks to the problem of thinking of the mass media space as a political critique space, because you can't say anything, you lose a TV show, you lose a, you can't, it's called you say what you're supposed to say and your contract allows you to not say anything else, and that's the end of that. It's, it's not an open space, it's not like tenure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And that's why I love this profession so far. We gotta keep it that way. Okay, just, just, I'm almost done. I know it's getting hot, hang on, okay. Um, so they can't, they can't articulate this, and so we don't really know whether or not this is a prerequisite for their performance. The other, the other piece has to do with consumerism. And Lauren Hill's you know, record, who one of my own grad students who I think is here, hit me to the significant political challenges in that record. I wouldn't have probably listened all the way through without you know, Shamara's assistant, insistence. Um, 
But it's important to think about the role of consumerism, how women's high style, as stylish as black women are, they just they have to have luxury imprinteurs to even talk about that style in mainstream commercial culture, which the economics of it's one thing, but the sheer consumption of it as a mode of, of sort of status is, is a major piece of it. So I'm wondering, and I guess this would be my tentative claim that we can certainly debate, but that ours vociferous, and it's very powerful in the media and in the public uh, realm, our vociferous and sustained battle against respectability politics may have obscured the powerful and problematic influences of mass-mediated representations, which for the most part rely on controlling images of black women's sexuality. And the neoliberal attempt to privatize and consolidate the popular terrain has encouraged us to consume mass-mediated expressions as if they were resistant popular ones. And so we've lost the Stuart Hall distinction there and, and, and assumed a connection that may not be there. So this neoliberal practice to return to Hall is the incorporation of politically radical challenges to, to dominant repressive ones. And of course, they're very seductive because of course these women are profoundly talented and they come to us via black cultural style and expressive cultures. And uh, in particular, Formation is a great example of the, this, the, the breadth of a legacy of black vernacular culture that Beyonce relies on there very powerfully. Um, but when, when you have that gateway and it moves from that space into this mass media space with no marker, it's, it's even more difficult to, to assess. It also dovetails with market consumption desires stoked by uh, consumerism, co-ops the language of black radicalism or black feminism, but not the struggle itself, and it attaches this language to some kind of consumer behavior that feeds our desire for polished political radicalism. So if we engage in these issues of the political resistance in popular or mass culture, perhaps we should avoid beginning with a challenge to respectability politics. By stepping over this broad expanse of mass-mediated narratives um, of black women to refuse to perform respectability politics ends up looking like freedom, but is it? Are we, in the absence of a respectability politics-based kind of pressure, are we sexually free? To put it another way, what constitutes black feminist sexual resistance to social constraint? and mass-mediated pressures toward the representation of controlling images. What happens after respect respectability politics is dead? To put another way, and to borrow from Beyonce, is paper your best revenge? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, that was very lovely. Thanks very much for all that energy back at me. Um, we have mic people with official microphones. So if you have a question or comment or wanna have a, just share some thoughts, just raise your hand so they can find you. Oh wait, there's someone in the red. Thank you so much for your talk. It was really great. Um, my question is sort of surrounding the consumption of black bodies um, and how gender binary it is. Um, I think about black women in the media and in entertainment as hypersexualized, and then black men primarily in professional sports as being hyper-masculine. And I'm trying to think about um, people who don't fit how narratives of um, black people who are not, who don't, who are erased because of this binary perspective. Um, and I just wanted to see if you had any commentary about how these sort of very gendered binaries in mass entertainment um, uh, fit in this narrative. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, the, I would, I'll, I'll send you to this book and then try to quickly do it because I don't want to be dismissive, like go read this book, but it's really helpful for this, which is Patricia Hill Collins' Black Sexual Politics because she talks about the way uh, femininity and masculinity, separate from maleness and female gender, uh, you know, ascription, 
is entirely different based on race. That is to say, you begin with a different set of assumptions about the, norma the normalcy of, of sort of black femininity and black masculinity, and what the terms are of what constitutes masculinity and femininity uh, are entirely different. So once you change the scale, then it's easier to sort of see what the nature of the exclusions and inclusions look like. Um, so I would have, for example, not have said that um, that the women are hypersexual and the men in the sports are masculine, I would also say they're hypersexualized. I'm not sure I would just change terms. That doesn't really help. Um, but um, but um, femininity for black women is actually non-normative. So it challenges even the use of radical female masculinity as a project for resistance for black women because it's already assumed that black women are themselves masculine and not, not adequately feminine in their ability to perform subordinate status. Do you see what I mean? So race and, and, and Hill Collins' framework, it just helps sort of unpack that. Does that help? Thank you. Hey there. She's coming. Are those your crutches? Sorry. It's okay. All right, it'll end. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask about how, how like respectability politics affects non-American blacks mm -hmm. because um, my parents are from Cameroon and they have very different ideas about like how American blacks should act <laughs> um, or like things they've told me. So I, I just want to hear kind of how you think that well, what, what do they what do they think? I can't really answer that like, oh, unless you tell me what, just, what, what, what we're talking They're very like about. conservative. They like, you know, they, you know, they, they would be like, they would agree with like what Chris Rock said. And then, yeah. yeah, you don't have to go all the way to Cameroon to get that. You go right down the street. I mean, in other words, it is a battle. It's a, it's a, you know, it's an inside game on both sides, right? But your point is how does it translate internationally? So, I mean, there have been a lot of, uh, there's a lot of great research on this, and my, my colleague Paget Henry's in the room, who's much more of a specialist on Caribbean black political consciousness, way more than I would ever even claim to even be, so forgive me for doing a bad job right now, Paget. here we go. Um, but, um, you know, the context of, and we were just talking about this the other day, of of black controlled political space, even in the context of a, a racialized oppression, changes the contour of a kind of respectability politics. When, when you have that added, if you're in a country that's all black, right, or mostly black, as opposed to the United States, that claim is still potentially has all the same class issues associated with it, but it doesn't automatically invoke also the intention of white supremacy automatically. Right? It has the potential to mean something else. Um, but I also think the immigrant native-born tension is very important there because most immigrant groups, beyond any of any particular racial description, often consider the poor, the domestic poor, the, the, whoever is native to the country, to be insufficient and lazy and not hardworking enough compared to the immigrants who are willing to, you know, do all of this work to get where they are, right, and to take advantage of the great American dream. And of course, there is a much more opportunity, and so it's, it's a little hard to argue at certain points. But Mary Waters has a very good book on the tension between Caribbean, um, Caribbean immigrants in, Amer in the U.S. and U.S.-born blacks um, on, on some of those issues. But, you know, I, again, I'm not, I mean, I just think the way respectability politics is, is used is very problematic. But I'm not sure I'm against the idea that there are behaviors that are more productive for one's well-being than not. So, you know, then I get into like, what do you do with that? Is that character talk? Is that just what you tell your kids, but then you never say in public? You know, I mean, one of the things Randall Kennedy said in the piece, which was a little bit of poke to the, to the loud leftist, was like, yeah, you all pander in respectability politics. You wear suits to an interview. I don't see you going to an interview, you know, wearing a T-shirt, and then you want to make this claim that respectability politics. Now, he's being a little, you know, I wouldn't go that far, but I, his point is you don't reject it everywhere, right? And so that opens the door to saying, okay, when are you using it under duress as opposed to when do you think it's a good idea? 
And when is it really something to be completely rejected? So that would be the way I would try to parse it out rather than get caught in this, in this binary. Does that help? That was a very helpful, good question. I really appreciated it. Yeah. So you mentioned this suit and the t-shirt, and you mentioned something earlier about the role of luxury and validating certain styles as being worthy gold. of... Gold. Sorry? You said I mentioned something earlier about gold. No, I'm sorry, oh. about luxury. And oh, luxury, in terms sorry. of dressing now and being mm -hmm. um, gaining like respectability in terms right, of right. fashion. Right, I gotcha. Can you elaborate more about kind of that realm when women are representing themselves and how mm -hmm. like street style has been appropriated now within certain cultures and luxury? Mm -hmm. um, just yeah. All right, well, the suit I mentioned only because Randall Kennedy mentioned the suit. Okay. So I'm just, I'm not owning that one. I'm just referring, citing. Um, but, you know, um, it's a hard question to answer quickly. Um, there's always been a collision between the aesthetics of African-American culture. I'm just gonna say African-American, that's the one I work on. It doesn't mean it doesn't impl uh, relate to other members of the African diaspora. In fact, it does, but I'm gonna just stay in my sweet spot for the sake of, you know, intelligence. It's a good idea, stay where you, stay with what you know. But African-American aesthetics have consistently been chided for its exuberant use of, you know, bricolage, of, of putting things together in unexpected ways and that give a kind of outsized extreme look. So when you think about the early use in hip hop of customized, you know, Gucci pants, you know, that were jeans with massive Gucci patches and 14 gold chains, you'd think, okay, why? Well, there's a long history of that kind of layering and accumulation and excess as a, a style. It wouldn't be called excess if were it not for this other standard that gets applied in relationship to it. That, that tradition was mostly related to found objects, to using objects in the material world that were free and available and useful, bottles, you know, uh, string, just right, right. But once consumer capitalism becomes the currency for style, then you start seeing the, the use of you know, high luxury goods as a form of status marker, but then used in unconventional ways. And once used in unconventional ways, r brings up a lot of actually sometimes consumer and some corporate discomfort. You know, Tommy Hilfiger, for example, was not really happy with hip hop's use of his shoes and boots and style um, because it just didn't, didn't represent the brand properly. Um, he changed his mind after I think he looked at some numbers, but um, <laughs> he really, someone told him, there's a lot of money in this. He's like, it's terrific. You know, it's like <laughs> literally a straight 180. Um, but those are the ways those things come together. But for women in particular, um, it attaches in a different way, the, the way in which the, the, the notion of a beauty a, a, um, aesthetic um, relies on um, fashion in its more traditional sense. You have less of that reappropriation in, oh, you get it with hairstyles, but not so much with, you know, the fashion industry itself. Um, again, I'm not against it. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just, I feel a little bit like I have to make a footnote to my own argument. I guess I just want us to think about what this means, right, in terms of the, you know, the kind of radical, the radical potential. There you go. Sure. Yeah. Hi there. Hang on. Someone's coming. Don't rush. Hi. Hi. Um, so I guess also sort of somewhat related to this dichotomy, but in the aesthetics of it. Mm -hmm. um, definitely as someone who has a complex relationship with a flat iron, I am curious, like, with the flat iron. Oh, flat iron. <laughs> um, okay. But uh, I'm curious about what it is about the different spaces that they've retained different relationships to respectability politics. Certainly, I know that when I go into a job interview, I absolutely contemplate what's going to make me look professional. Um, and in that way, I would say it really has retained sort of these traditional respectability politics elements, but there mm -hmm. is definitely within the mass media a violation and a deliberate violation. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about what is it about those spaces that makes them uh, tend towards one end or the other? 
tend towards one end, which is what? The sort of the, where you feel like it makes sense to use it, and then the other where it doesn't? Yeah. Is that the bottom? Okay. Well, look, you know, there is a, there's an assumption, and I mean, I'm not going to say I'm any different. If I, I usually go to job interviews dressed in whatever the typical appropriate garb is supposed to be for that job myself, but there is a buy-in there that's implicit. You know, not everybody does, and it's not just because they don't know. It's also because they feel like they want to go as they're supposed to go and who they want to be, and that may not fit the traditional sort of bourgeois, you know, American model of middle-class, you know, job we're dressing for the job you want, not the job you have, you know. I don't know who made that one up. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think it's important to point out that buy-in. Like, you know, that, that doesn't mean it's good, bad, or indifferent. I'm not making a judgment, but it is a buy-in that everyone does not necessarily have. Um, but I think the, the, the main constraint has to do with when people, I think on the negative side, when people feel very strongly that um, they have to conform through forms of, of shaming and disparagement and insult, which tends to revolve around almost everything sexual for women. Um, if you'd think, you know, there would be, we would have moved much further along on this conversation. And again, you look at the women with so much visibility in the public arena and very, not a lot of conversation about key issues. I mean, abortion is a massive issue that is pretty much becoming, I mean, I wouldn't call it extinct, but it's been beaten to a pulp as an accessible practice, right, as an accessible medical treatment. And lots of people are dead silent on it, people who you would think would, could easily have something to say, but because the price is too high. So, so part of it to me has to do with the binary isn't so much about, one of the reasons you don't buy in is because you really want to hold firm on whatever your issue is and whatever that is, whether it's a, an ethnic outfit or whether it's a refusal to dress with a certain kind of presumed femininity or, wh or whatever it is that you're fighting. But there's also uh, you know, a, a different set of constraints that, that are about the kinds of silences that, um, that have more to do with this, this sort of ability to, to shame and marginalize that I think drives that binary in a different way. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a number of women who I know who do, you know, TV, and they pretty much always flat iron their hair when it's TV time. But without TV, they don't do it, you know? So it raises a lot of questions, like in order to get on TV, you gotta rock some straight hair, or maybe some attached braids or something that will look straight by a distance. Um, but you see very few, unless it's very close afro, and even then that's very rare. And it's much more prevalent now than way back in the day when it was just impossible. I mean, it was a flat iron or you don't leave the house. But, um, so that's a great thing, but it is rather striking how much pressure there is implicit to perform certain types of representations. Nice to see you. <laughs> Any other comments, questions? I'm, I'm more than happy to, to like, Hear some. Oh, okay. Hi, Lynn. I think they're coming. Yeah. Yes, of course. Um, so thank you, Tricia. It was totally fascinating and, and I think incredibly useful. Uh, the issues you raised, and I just want to, I think, kind of go, maybe push even a little farther about what you were saying in terms of we, we can't think about respectability uh, and, and sort of fighting against respectability as binary opposites. And I would say, especially in terms of media, I think that not only are they not binary opposites, I think, in fact, they're absolutely part of the same dynamic, right? And I think particularly if you're thinking about some of the media examples of that, right? So you talked about there's a way in which there's the kind of grooming for respectability as part of a neoliberal politic, but then, you know, in terms of what gets consumed, Right, that on television, you know, the things that get big ratings again would be like the the ratchet reality programs, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, even things like Real Housewives, it's you know the Real Housewives of of Atlanta, the quote unquote ratchet one, that's the one that gets the huge ratings, mm -hmm. and you know, et cetera, et cetera. But I think in some ways you can think of them as part of exactly, exactly the yeah, same right. system, right? Yeah. So it's I think part of the system yeah. where. What, and, and I think that what television is sort of teaching us in all of these forms is a mode of self-grooming, right, mm -hmm. in order to produce yourself as a particular kind of brand image mm -hmm. that can kind of move on in the competition so that you're not, you know, so to speak, voted off the island, right? right? And so whether or not that means 
through sort of reality programs where you're told you have to be respectable, you have to learn to take care of yourself, you have to have right responsibility, or whether it's, again, producing a particular kind of image of the disrespectful, but right. in order to get enough attention so that, once again, you're not voted off the island, that you're, mm -hmm. you're allowed to proceed enough to be granted right. the sort of citizenship of That's consumerism. Right. You know, it's all in a way part of the same dialectic, right? right. So I think you see that, like even now right. with like today's election, when you know Omarosa is always on TV, sort of arguing for Donald Trump now, right, and using her sort of status as like the bad girl from reality TV to now argue, mm -hmm. you know, this is a way That's into right. the political system. Yep. Or you know, like the way you mentioned Empire, for example, and the character of Cookie who does. She's like exemplary of showing exactly how you manage that to produce enough of the kind of ratchet image, to have a brand image, to have right. a kind of persona right. that then will allow you yep. to be able to go forward so that you can kind of make it in the neoliberal economy where you have to take, you know, you have to self-fashion yep. in order to... So right. to me what's so fascinating, again, is exactly how th they're absolutely wedded together yep. and posing them as an opposition I think, as you showed, kind of undermines any possibility for a deeper political action because we're always still stuck in that right. kind of right. consumerism, neoliberal cycle. Right. I couldn't. I couldn't so have again, said it I think better. it was you were yeah. great in showing how that worked. Thank you. No, I, I, you know, I had that stage, but then I, I, it was hard for me to, in the amount of time, circle back to the question of the black feminist tension, right? So that's really why I didn't stay, th I was going there. I was, you know, when I was writing, I was going there and I was like, you know, you know, this, this really speaks to the problem of this sort of, you know, the incorporation of the popular into mass, first of all, under a neoliberal regime on both sides. And so, but, but the real, if you're thinking of a grounded political intervention, I would say to young black feminists, don't start with respectability politics. Start with the neoliberal cultural industry landscape and in there is some respectability politics, in there is ratchet, in there is, and then sort of think of think it through. But that in fact, one of the ways we get manipulated is into thinking that our freedom lies in rejecting respectability politics, which out of all of these things is the only thing that has a black tradition attached to it, too, right? Which may you disagree with, you can fight over the different class dimensions perhaps and different political trajectories because there's more than one version of it but it would be the only black thing to, and that it would be the thing that gets sort of pushed away in favor of consumption and, and, an, and an unclear protocol for what looks like sexual freedom. You know, um, like what does sexual freedom really look like? I think it's a hard question to answer, but we don't, we get, we get, we go straight to the pleasure of the consumption because we've all been, you know, forced there. And it, it makes it harder to really pull back and ask that other question. So I, I completely agree with you about that. And, and um, I just, you know, made a different turn because I wanted to really speak to that sub piece about, you know, the, the ways in which this process is manipulating a trajectory of a, of, of, a, of a black feminist consciousness. Not that it's, we're all, we're all stuck in it. It's not generational, but it's just showing up generationally because it's just more visible and it's more targeting young women, whereas they, they don't really make videos for me. You know, they're making it for somebody else. So that was why I went there, but I totally agree with the neoliberal you know, ba you know, pulling back. Thank you, Lynn, that was really helpful. I'm glad they videotaped that, I'm gonna borrow it. Any other questions, do you have time for one or two? Or, okay, we have, okay. Hello, we have hi. Oh my gosh, hi. Is this one? I'm good, how are you? Good. Um, my question, when you were, so I want you to maybe expand on a point. Um, when you were talking about Beyonce, I thought back of on freshman year and a lot of conversations that I was having with my male friends when Beyonce's album came out and them be com being confused about the fact that we were always talking about objectifying being a problem, but then, and then suddenly Beyonce's album, like us, I guess, us defending Beyonce's album yeah. um, and her, and more seeing it as a sexual liberation, they were confused. Okay, so what is feminism? And it yeah. might not, it's is confused. it not exploding, exploding and not objectifying, or is it, sexual liberation and Beyonce's agency in that. Um, and so I was also confused when I was talking about it. I was like, oh, you know, I don't, I'm not sure. And so when you were talking about um, respectability politics not really existing in certain spaces in the media and therefore Beyonce's sexual 
or hypersexuality not being subversive because it's, because it's, right, so it's the norm and not, right, so it's like the accepted. It's claimed to be per, per, uh, subversive, but it's, but it's not required. Right, right, I that's mean, what I'm saying, right, so it becomes a problem it's because it's a prerequisite for success. Right. Um, so then could you expand on then how to, how to think about it, right? So if, am I supposed to think about her in the media as kind of existing in the space that because in that space is not, is the norm, mm -hmm. what she does, does it not affect my everyday life in, in terms of how to, do you under, try to understand? It's like, I think so, so, I think so. I can try to stumble around. If I don't get it right, you can just poke me again. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, you know, part of the, part of the, the tension is that, you know, we want to have a political safe justification for our consumption. So, the, you know, we're looking for like, you know, I only like radical rappers where, you know, when they shoot people legitimately, you know, or something, you know, it's like, <laughs> hey, you know, desire is complex. It's manipulated from day one from a whole range of things. And, you know, you should listen to what you want to listen to. But you should also recognize that that might mean you have to self, you have to interrogate yourself about that pleasure rather than trying to figure out how to make it fit. Because that's really what neoliberal culture industry has done. It has sort of taken black radical ideas, it's taken, you know, feminism and black feminism and, and created a post-feminist, post-civil rights, you know, occupation and has everybody like partying like it's a radical practice. You know, and I don't mind the partying part because every song is not a political project, you know, in that sense of the word. But if for it to stand in and for us, if I could tell you how many people want to write about the feminism of these big stars, but not the feminism of everyday black women, not the radical everyday grounded practices where they don't do it, or the artists who stay on the margins like this woman, Akuanaru, who I'm going to try to, if I can ever write this application for him, get her here for next year for a few weeks as an artist in residence who's just amazing, but who will never be seen at this level. She breaks all the kinds of rules that you would normally. She got dreads down to her knees. She talks about white supremacy. She can rhyme her butt off. She's just, you know, you're not going to see her there unless something very significant happens. You'll see her at a, you know, some level. So, so. You know, the question isn't really only the pleasure in the consumption, but what we want to attach to that consumption, you know? You know, so when she sings, you know, when Beyonce sings, you know, girls rule the world, girls do not rule the daggone world. <laughs> it's a fantasy song, okay? Enjoy it, okay? That's the truth. Trust me, women don't run the world, girls definitely don't rule the world, okay? Now, does that mean we don't have any power? No, I didn't say that. Do that mean that everyone should give up? No, but I'm saying this kind of idea that by positing this is a feminist act, but then just talking about the violence against women, the economic discrimination against women, the way in which race plays a role, I mean, all of that never, there's never an interview, there's never a follow-up. <laughs> there's never anything that, and it, it doesn't have to be, but you're, it, the thing I want us to interrogate is our relationship to that presence and that absence. Right? I'm not asking people to not consume. It's a ridiculous request at this point. But to consume with a level of criticalness um, and a kind of a political challenge to the self about what we're actually doing so that it doesn't just become, you don't see the feminism in fill in the blank because I feel feminist when I listen. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, push me and I'm gonna push you, right? Because, because so much is at stake. You know, so this isn't really just about who we like and what artists we like. There's a bunch of brilliant, talented people who never make it anywhere, right? But the question is, what is the cost and price of who makes it to the top? And how much attention of ours do they have? Who gets more of our attention than these figures? I mean, it's, there's really no one who comes close. And that matters because the cultivation of our, of our scope, of our landscape, what constitutes the political boundaries of expression, what happened to kind of radical women who simply refuse a variety of expectations and do it happily with no loss of self and who don't sit around wondering about their efficacy or whether or not their sexuality or their gender or their look is somehow gonna impact their world. Like these people, are, these women are here, they exist, but they're not in our general landscape. So th that it's sort of pushing them from the margins to the center 
through not a rejection of Beyonce, enjoy it, right? Have a good time, but don't let it crowd this out, right? It's not ground zero for the next stage of radical feminism. It, it's not, and that's okay. You can do both until you get tired of doing this one, and then you'll be like, I don't even need Beyonce anymore. See, that's my, that's my Trojan horse. <laughs> At some point, you'll be like, I don't even need Beyonce, except for an occasional Saturday, you know? Anyway, do you see my point where I'm, okay, thank you. Thank you all so much for coming and staying. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much.